Chapter 30, How to Abide in Christ. The Gospel of John has held a special place in the heart of saints for countless generations. In fact, chapters 13 through 17 have always been considered some of the most treasured chapters within John's Gospel. The twofold reason for this identification, one, the loftiness of the material covered, and two, the exclusivity of the audience receiving Christ's teaching. Within this section, we find the Savior's teaching on abiding in Him and His abiding in believers. Although John chapter 15 is one of the most recognizable chapters in God's Word, it is unfortunately also one of the most misunderstood. For a moment, set aside the articles, commentaries, and opinions that you have read or heard on this passage. Because this passage is so misunderstood, each person must be willing to consider it with an open mind and fresh perspective. Try to block out the man-made biases that serve to cloud one's understanding. Let's take a fresh look at the meaning and purpose of Christ's teaching on abiding in Christ and Christ abiding in the individual believer. Here is the subject within its fuller context. Take note of the abiding, the husbandman, the branch, and the vine. John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Each branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me... He is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. A careful reading of this passage indicates that the Savior's purpose was to remind the eleven disciples of their total dependency upon God, along with their purpose for living. In summary, abiding in Christ would yield fruit and an ongoing discipleship. Furthermore, understanding both the content and the audience should suffice to prove that the passage has absolutely nothing to do with retaining one's salvation. Instead, consider the prominent elements of the passage at hand. The mutual indwelling is seen in the phrases in me and in the vine appearing seven times, and in you or in him appearing three times. The word abide or abideth appears seven times. The word bear or beareth appears four times, and the word fruit appears six times. At the outset, it is important to dispel one of the most prominent teachings concerning abiding. Christ is speaking to his eleven saved apostles and certainly not advising them concerning abiding to stay saved. He would later state that none of them is lost but the son of perdition, John 17, 12. The Audience It is important to consider the timing and the audience of Christ's teaching before offering any interpretation of the passage. The subject of abiding in Christ Jesus followed Jesus' acknowledgement of the arrival of his hour, John 13, 1. Footnote number 1. The hour of Jesus, his hour, refers to the hour of his suffering, John 12, 27, Matthew 26, 45. He mentioned this hour seven times in John's Gospel. Three of these references came before his hour was come in John 13, 1. John 2, 4, John 7, 30, John 8, 20, and four of the references came after his hour was come, John 12, 23, and 27, John 16, 32, and John 17, 1. The teaching concerning abiding in Christ came after the washing of the disciples' feet, John 13, 3 through 17, and after Judas had departed from the group, John 13, 18 through 30. Lastly, it took place after Christ proclaimed, what he would do for men during his absence, John 14, 1 through 27. This included stating that he would depart to prepare a place, John 14, 1 through 3. He would be available to answer prayer, John 14, 12 through 14. And he would provide a comforter in his place, John 14, 15 through 27. However, the dialogue occurred prior to Christ entering the garden for prayer, John 18, 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Chidron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. This teaching of abiding would be some of the last teaching prior to Christ heading to the cross. 
With this context in mind, the Lord directed this intimate portion of teaching found in John's gospel to a small band of men. These men would soon have to learn how to rely on Christ in a way much different than what they had over the last three years of his earthly ministry. The point was to teach the disciples in Christ's physical absence how to bring forth fruit for the Savior. Simply put, they could not bring forth fruit without spiritually abiding in him. People don't abide in him by willing to stay saved or or working to stay saved. The pieces of the teaching. The identity of three key components to the teaching must be identified from the outset. The vine, the husband, the branches. Israel was frequently identified as a vine, Psalm 80, verses 8 through 16, Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, Hosea 10, 1. Yet the true vine is clearly Jesus Christ. Jesus was called the true vine to contrast him with the nation of Israel. After all, Israel became known as the empty vine that bringeth forth fruit unto himself. Hosea 10.1 Jesus Christ, however, was the true vine that sought to bring forth fruit unto the husbandman. The passage also points to God the Father as the husbandman. John 15.1 I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. One more primary element remains unidentified. Early in the passage, Christ's audience was identified as branches, John 15, 2 and verse 4. Then Christ addressed his audience and said, Ye are the branches, John 15, 5. It is important to identify the ye in the passage, and it is certainly not all Israel, the believing and the unbelieving. We recognize this because Christ's immediate audience was made up solely of believers. The four problems in the teaching. To gain God's perspective concerning the subject passage, one must consider several problems set forth by the Lord. The first problem is self-inflicted and comes when a man chooses not to bring forth fruit. In doing so, a man fails in his God-given responsibility and loses his opportunity to bring glory to God. The second problem identified by the Savior is not self-inflicted, but involves an unchanging law. Without me, that is Christ, ye can do nothing. The third problem is again self-inflicted and involves the consequences suffered by those refusing to obediently abide in the vine. The final problem is a matter of proper interpretation. Failure to properly identify and comprehend any of these problems can lead to a misinterpretation and misapplication of the New Testament teaching on abiding. Number one, the problem with choice. Blaming others for one's failures and shortcomings is far too common today. This is especially true concerning fruit-bearing or the lack thereof. After all, the husbandman, God the Father, provides all the necessary nutrients and resources for the success of the vine. Furthermore, a man cannot say anything against the vine, Jesus Christ, because the vine is healthy and life-giving in every aspect. The main thing the branch needs to do is to abide in the vine. Those branches not abiding in the vine fail to bear fruit and are taken away. John 15:2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. The choice is clear. A man who fails to abide in Christ will bring forth no fruit and will be taken away and burned. John 15:6. A man who abides in Christ bears fruit and is purged so that he can bring forth more fruit. This truth poignantly describes the life of believers. Some bear fruit while others refuse to do so. Fruit bearing and non-fruit bearing has absolutely nothing to do with one's salvation. In fact, most believers never bear the fruit God intended for them to bear in their lifetimes. Not only does man's choice enable him to bear fruit, but abiding in the vine allows for the cleansing of the word. John 15, 3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. As the branch abides in the vine, the word spoken by the vine cleanses, purifies, and heals the branch. In other words, so long as the branch abides in the vine, it need not worry about disease that would corrupt its ability to bring forth fruit. God's word offers cleansing. Number two, the problem with incapability. If the problem of choice were not enough, there are also God-given limitations. While it is true that we should serve God because of everything he has done for us, our efforts have no fruit-bearing potential apart from abiding in the vine. John 15:4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Every believer will remain fruitless without the life-giving power of Christ. One simply cannot serve in one's own strength of the flesh. 
As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, the individual cannot bear fruit of himself. Jesus clearly stated that without abiding in him, we can do nothing. Yet far too many Christians view their accomplishments and think the outcome or the results are based upon their abilities, their strengths, or their efforts. Bearing fruit in the Christian walk is all about Jesus. If you want to bear fruit, abide in Christ. If you are not bearing fruit, you are not abiding in the life-sustaining vine. Number three, the problem with consequences. The consequences of failing to abide in Christ are simple, a fruitless and ultimately useless life. Not abiding in Christ is likened to a branch detached from a vine that withers and dies. These branches are judged as vain and empty, good for nothing, cast in the fire. Yet this fire is in no way associated to anyone losing his salvation and spending an eternity burning in hell. John fifteen six. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. The believer who does not abide in the vine eventually withers. The withered branches are gathered by men and cast in the fire. These gathered branches with all the other detached branches, including the past purged from the fruit bearing branches, are burned. Unfortunately, some Bible teachers assume that fire always indicates hell. Yet, there's another fire that destroys the fruitless labors of God's people. In fact, 1 Corinthians describes what will take place when the dead branches are tried by fire at the judgment seat of Christ. Only the work built with gold, silver, and precious stones will survive the fire and receive a reward. Sadly, there's another work said to be built upon the flammable material of wood, hay, and stubble. It will not survive the fire. This is true of those who live their lives with wrong purposes and impure motives. They serve only to elevate self, and they steal the glory belonging to God himself. If one's motives prove wrong, the work will not abide, but will be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.14 If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. At the judgment the work abides, or the work burns up. All Christians tried by fire, not associated to the tares burned with fire in Matthew chapter 13. The individual's work is closely associated with the individual, and that is why the works that remain are associated to the person abiding forever, 1 John 2.17. Interestingly, the Bible says that the Christian will receive the things done in his body, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The fire at the judgment seat of Christ has the purpose of purifying and rewarding. Those whose work is burned refer to those who refuse to abide in the vine, not those who will be cast into hell. Yet those who are cast into the furnace of fire with the other tares of Matthew chapter 13 experience wailing and gnashing of teeth. The fire they experience will not be short-lived, but for eternity. Number four, the problem with confusion. Some people force hell into every verse associated to fire, but the branches gathered by men are not equivalent to the tares gathered by the angels. The offenders, called tares, are cast into the furnace where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is always a description of eternal damnation, never associated to Christians. Matthew 13:40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The actual scenario described in Matthew chapter 13 has no association to the event described with the vine and the branches of John chapter 15. If a saved man refuses to bear fruit, he is not cast into hell. Following Christ's judgment, he simply has nothing to show for his life's work as the fire tries and burns up his work at the judgment seat. In fact, even the fruit-bearing believer experiences a purging as his dead works are cut off to increase his fruitfulness. Hebrews 6.1 Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Hebrews 9.14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 
Every believer needs to bear fruit, but the only way to bear fruit is to receive the necessary nutrients from abiding in the vine. Every necessary tool for the believer has been cultivated by the husbandman, the father, and exists in the vine, the son. Among other things, we need to be reproductive by winning others to a saving knowledge of the Savior, Proverbs 11.30. Christians are ambassadors for Christ that should beseech others to be reconciled to him. 2 Corinthians 5.20 The purpose of purging. John chapter 15 describes the purpose and process of purging the fruit-bearing Christian. The purpose of purging is plainly designed to bring forth more fruit. John 15.2 Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. While purging is certainly not always an enjoyable process, yet it is necessary for Christian growth. When something is purged, the impurities are removed and the deadness cut off. A prayer of David helps to illustrate this purging which brings forth a cleansing. Psalm 51, 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Most Christians start out well, experiencing the joy of bearing fruit, and only to recoil when the Lord attempts to help them to produce more and greater fruit. The purging takes place through God's Word, involves cutting out detrimental things like bitterness, wrath, envy, and malice, which hinder a branch's ability to bear the right fruit in the right quantity. John 15:3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. The desired purpose and progression is easily identifiable. In our passage, the progression is identified as fruit, John 15.2, more fruit, John 15.2, and much fruit, John 15.8. In Matthew chapter 13, the fruit multiplication can be seen in the identifications of some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold, Matthew 13, 8, and verse 23. This is all very significant because the Lord said our Father is glorified in our fruit-bearing, John 15, 8. This truth matches the Savior's expression concerning glorifying the Father by letting our light shine. Matthew 5:16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. A Christian's works are the light the world needs to expel the darkness. The power of the produce. Believers enjoy both a practical and doctrinal mutual indwelling with Christ. See Ephesians 3.17. This indwelling is certainly for our benefit, but also serves the greater purpose of glorifying God. As repeatedly stated throughout Scripture, we cannot bear fruit of ourselves because the fruit only comes from abiding in Christ and His Word abiding in us. John 15:4. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing." The only way for Christians to bring forth the God-intended fruitful increase is by abiding in Christ. The process of abiding is rewarding, but can be painful at times. Despite the inherent joy of living a fruitful Christian life, Christians must never grow satisfied with what they do for the Lord, since our sufficiency is of God and not of ourselves. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The blessings abound for those who recognize that the produced fruit comes from God working in us and through us. One's capabilities are based solely upon being attached to Christ. Yet continued fruitfulness comes only as we abide in him and his words abide in us. John 15, 7, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Christ points out these truths repeatedly. If ye abide in him, and his words abide in you, you shall receive what you ask. A person abides in Jesus by allowing his word to abide in him. The key to living fruitful is God's word working in us and for us and through us. The Father is glorified when God's disciples choose to abide in Christ and bear much fruit. 
John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be his disciples. The context of abiding. Those who keep God's commandments abide in his love. The Savior simplified things when he stated that his commandment is that we love one another in the same way he loved us, an unconditional love. John 15, 9, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. John fifteen seventeen. These things I command you, that ye love one another. The Lord repeatedly stated his desire, love one another. We should extend grace and understanding toward others. We must do that, but especially in our homes and churches. Jude mentions this abiding from another perspective, by keeping yourselves in the love of God, ye are abiding in him. Jude 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Unfortunately, those looking for works to keep one's salvation misinterpret the concept of abiding. The abiding has nothing to do with abiding in salvation, but everything about abiding in the source of one's sustenance to bring forth fruit that remains. The next verse in John reiterates the calling, bring forth fruit. Christianity simply does not need more fruitless Christians. John fifteen sixteen. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. John also mentioned the promise attached to the provision, that your fruit should remain. This summarized the true biblical meaning of the abiding. We are to bring forth fruit and abide in Christ to ensure that our fruit remains. God wants to purge all of us, thus cleaning us up, so that we can bring forth God-glorifying fruit. God's Word is the only means whereby the cleansing can take place. The Confirmation of the Abiding Both John's Gospel and his first epistle testify concerning these truths and principles regarding abiding. First John seems to focus more on the one who claims to be abiding without the evidence of the abiding in Christ. We should all desire to walk like Christ because abiding in Christ yields a Christ-likeness that should be the testimony of every Christian. In this case, John's epistle points to those who claim to be abiding or saith that is so, yet those who say that they are abiding should exhibit the evidence of a Christ-likeness. The admonition is clear. Those who say they are abiding ought to walk like Jesus walked. 1 John 2, 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. The context of the epistle can be no clear. If you talk the talk, make sure that your walk matches your talk. Simply saying that one abiding in Christ is insufficient, especially when no proof of one's abiding exists. The greatest proof of an abiding is reflected in one primary area, love for others. Those who hate their brethren are abiding in darkness, not abiding in the light, although the light was given that the believers should not abide in darkness, John 12:46. Again, the context points to someone that saith or makes a claim, but his walk does not match his talk. 1 John 2, 9, He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Because the darkness blinded his eyes, this brother cannot even see that he is abiding or walking in the darkness, not in the light. People are deceived into thinking that Christians can hate others and still be right with God, even when God said, Love your enemies and do good to them which hate you, Luke 6.27. When believers fail to love those whom they can see, they certainly cannot love God whom they cannot see. Those who believe and know the truth should love others with a demonstrable love. Like John's Gospel, John's first epistle identifies abiding as a choice that one should let happen. 1 John 2.24 
Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. This abiding is a choice and has absolutely nothing to do with keeping one's salvation. The scripture unequivocally teaches that the abiding is always associated with bearing fruit, which is directly associated to the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Abiding contrasts having confidence in one's walk versus being ashamed of one's life, especially when Christ returns. 1 John 2.28, and now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, ye may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous... Ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. At Christ appearing, Titus 2.13, those who have abided in Christ will not be ashamed. If failing to abide indicated losing one's salvation, being ashamed seems like a gross misunderstatement for someone burning in hell for all eternity. Christians must abide in Christ to bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit. What will your life have counted for when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ? Purging may be painful here, but suffering loss at the judgment seat of Christ will prove far more consequential. John points out that the true assurance of salvation comes from loving the brethren. 1 John 3.14 We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Loving the brethren does not earn salvation, but loving one's brother proves that the individual is no longer abiding in death. The love of God, or eternal life, simply does not abide in those who do not love the brethren. John likens a hater to a murderer and says that eternal life, Christ himself, does not abide in a murderer. John pointed directly to Christ as eternal life dwelling in the believer when he wrote, We bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto you. 1 John 1, 2. John concludes his first epistle by pointing to Jesus Christ as the eternal life that indwells the believer, although he may not have that abiding. 1 John 5.20, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. We are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. The point of 1 John is to know or perceive the truth. We are told that a heartless person who shuts up his compassion toward those in need may claim to know God, but simply denies him in his walk. Jesus Christ indwells every believer, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. But the choices we make determine whether he abides in us. This is the end of chapter 30.